-hmm. I have a great pleasure to talk to uh, Professor uh, Stephen Wallace, and we are at NYU. Uh, we, uh, we are during your lecture about the sinus lift elevation. Uh, what tips could you give to, uh, to the dentist, to the implantologist, uh, about the sinus lift elevator procedure? Okay, well, there are certainly many tips that, that you could give. Uh, the first one that I would, uh, I would give is that it's really mandatory to get a CAT scan before you start to determine the sinus anatomy and also the sinus health, never to do a procedure on an unhealthy sinus because the outcome will be poor. Uh, know your sinus anatomy, know the various techniques, and know the instrumentation that's the safest for doing the procedure. You also have to have a knowledge of how to treat complications because complications will happen. It doesn't matter who you are. Membranes will tear, patient will bleed. You have to know how to fix it. If you have all of this under control, then you can experiment with things that make the procedure better in your hands. Mm -hmm. And how to start uh, doing this sinus lift procedure? Uh, for example, uh, is it a procedure for uh, young, in young implantologists or experienced one? Well, certainly you should know how to place implants and have surgical experience. The sinus is just a different type of, of environment. It's a three more of a three-dimensional surgery. And the best way to get experience with that is first to listen and get an idea of what has to be done, and then perhaps take a cadaver course so you can now convert that into three-dimensional hands-on training, and then read and understand what's good, what graft materials work, what implant types you should use, and what you're trying to accomplish. Mm -hmm. And it's easy, it's an easy procedure to learn if you are surgically inclined. Mm -hmm. Uh, you showed also um, piezo surgery uh, in sinus lift elevator procedure. Uh, what we should uh, gain using this uh, uh, piezo surgery? Well, we always did in the United States sinus elevations with rotary instrumentation. And you have a certain perforation rate that might be about 20%. You get better with time and your perforation rate lowers down. But there are always new people involved and in, in I've been teaching for 25 years and I'm always teaching new people. Uh, I learned how to do a uh, piece of surgery from Tommaso Vercellati. I was the first person in the United States to have a unit here. And I find that in my own hands, I can do things better with fewer complications and that my students learn quicker because they stay out of trouble, they build up their confidence, and they go forward rather than backwards. Mm -hmm. And w what we should uh, learn or what we should uh, remember uh, when uh, we talk about vascularization of the sinus lift and the window, uh, uh, the place uh, w w we, d we do window? Well, y our blood supply to our graft comes from the bony walls. So we should use some type of common sense in making our windows of, our, of maybe a smaller dimension, although we only know from research that making smaller windows will give us a higher percentage of vital bone in a given period of time, but we don't know if that makes a difference with implant outcome. So I say that although it's very nice to maintain the bone to give you a better blood supply, it's also very nice maybe to make your window a little bit larger so that you're more able to avoid complications and complete the procedure without turning it into an aborted procedure. Mm -hmm. uh, you also showed uh, a few interesting things about the septum. Uh, someone said that we should make uh, two uh, windows when we have a uh, septum. What do you think about this? Well. A septum creates problems for us and because it's now something that we have to work around. Uh, it's sharp, it's thin, and our vision of it is difficult. If you choose to make two windows, neither one of the windows will be over the area where the septum is. So I completely discard that idea in saying that the more difficult the procedure comes, and a septum makes it more difficult, 
the larger I want to make my window to give me better access so I could be successful. So I would make one large window that goes over the area of the septum and it's right in front of me and I can see it. Two small windows are both small and they're both away from the object that I'm trying to see. So I don't think that's a good idea. Mm -hmm. We also learn uh, interesting things about the residual bone. Uh, so how long we should wait uh, in different cases with uh, residual bone? Well, that's a difficult question. Okay, certainly the residual crustal bone is the only thing that you have supporting your implant at the time of implant placement. So now you have to wait for your bone graft to mature. And the bone calcification is going to occur from the bony walls and from the floor at a rate of one millimeter per month. So if you have a CAT scan that shows you how wide your sinus is and where your implant's going to go, you can calculate the number of months it's going to take before the rest of your implant has bony support. So if you start out with a small amount of crestal bone, you're absolutely reliant on the new bone to, to stabilize your implant under load. You have to wait longer. If you have a lot of crestal bone, well, you don't really need it that much, so you wait less time. Uh -huh. And what do you think uh, about the immediate implant procedure and uh, uh, sinus lift elevation? The, we've, we've always had misinformation on when to do simultaneous implant placement. We were told at the beginning, arbitrarily, that if you have four to five millimeters of bone, you can place the implant at the same time. Well, that really doesn't mean anything because what's important is that you achieve primary stability of the implant. If you can do that in two millimeters of bone there's no, and then protect the implant from loading until the bone forms, there's no reason not to do that. So for simultaneous placement, I have to do a couple things when I have a small amount of bone. I have to achieve primary stability, number one. Number two, I have to have the soft tissue closed over the top of the implant so that the biologic width doesn't form and we lose a millimeter of crestal bone. And three, I have to protect it from load until the new bone forms to help stabilize it with secondary uh, implant stability. Mm -hmm. And what do you think about the growth factors uh, in sinus lift procedures and uh, PRF and LPRF? Well, we're talking about different things. First, we're talking about LPRF being a biologic. It's a very good biologic space maintainer. It helps in repairing perforations. You can make solid blocks out of the material by incorporating it with graft material. So uh, for clinical purposes, it works very good and it helps very much with soft tissue healing. Growth factors such as recombinant PDGF beta have been shown in studies that I've done and other people have done to give us our bone much more quickly. So we can take an eight month bone formation time and turn it into a four month bone formation time. So that is a positive. We don't get better results, we get them faster. Regarding bone morphogenetic proteins, BMP2, my feeling is that the results with it in sinus grafting have been less than remarkable. It costs too much money and it gives us nothing and I don't think there's any place for it in sinus grafting. Mm -hmm. And at the end, uh, could you say something to our patients? Uh, so uh, is nowadays a sinus procedure or open sinus lift or a closed sinus lift procedure, is it a safe procedure and uh, should be in common use in every dental office? Well, in every dental office where the, the practitioner is trained to do it. Uh, it's a perfectly safe procedure. You start out with a healthy sinus, you're probably not going to get in trouble. Both procedures, whether open or closed, are used depending upon how much crestal bone you have and what you're trying to achieve. Uh, if you, again, start out with a healthy sinus, do the procedure properly, the complication rate, other than intraoperative complications like bleeding and membrane perforation, the, 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 the postoperative complication that you might worry about is infection rate. Starting out with a healthy compliant sinus, this is unlikely and the infection rate in lateral window procedures is probably less than 2%. And with good technique, good case with good case selection, surgical protocol and proper antibiotics, uh, uh, a postoperative sinus infection is a very rare event. <laughs>